The United Arab Emirates is waging a war for influence over the Horn of Africa. The UAE has used the Assad port to send military gear and soldiers to Yemen, while using its facilities to hold prisoners of war. The United Arab Emirates has agreed to invest three billion US dollars into the Ethiopian economy. Abu Dhabi has been accused of funding and supporting militants across the Horn of Africa and the Gulf of Aden. But do the UAE's growing ambitions harm the stability of Somalia, Ethiopia and Sudan? Since the 2011 Arab Spring, the United Arab Emirates has been taking an active role in a number of hotspots from Egypt, Libya to Yemen. The Gulf nation has spent $26 billion annually on its defense budget since 2016, and this is expected to increase to $37.8 billion by 2025. A growing security and war industry with military deployments abroad, US generals often refer to the Shechtham as Little Sparta. As of 2020, the UAE has military bases in Eritrea, Djibouti and Somaliland, which further indicates the importance of the Horn of Africa to Abu Dhabi. The region offers excellent access to the Red Sea, the Mediterranean and the Gulf of Aden, all of which are vital to the Emirates' economic future as a global trading hub. The military bases ensure Abu Dhabi can see off threats to its interests and secure its influence over East Africa at a time when it's expanding its income streams away from the petrodollar. The 2015 war in Yemen and the 2017 blockade of Qatar have seen Abu Dhabi take a more aggressive role in East Africa. 2011, the UAE has been uh, conducting a very muscular foreign policy far beyond the Gulf region. Abu Dhabi has vested interests in the African continent and the Horn of Africa is very critical to understanding the UAE's foreign policy in the continent at large. Horn of Africa is a very volatile region with some of the world's most impoverished countries. What we have seen is a relative decline in U.S. influence in the Horn of Africa and smaller actors such as the UAE, but also many others, are also working to try to fill some of the voids. Countries in the Horn of Africa have by and large welcomed growing ties with the Arab world. But in 2017, following the breaking of diplomatic relations between Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain, Egypt and Qatar, countries across the world were pushed to take sides. This dispute between Qatar and its immediate neighbors on the Arabian Peninsula, as well as Egypt, has had a very polarizing effect on the Horn of Africa. This dispute in the GCC is very much one that is a zero-sum dispute. You're either with the blockading countries or you're against the blockading countries, as Abu Dhabi and Riyadh see it. Although the 2017 Gulf crisis now looks like it's coming to an end, the countries in the Horn of Africa have already paid the price for it. Somalia found itself at the unwelcome end of the dispute. يزداد مستقبل العلاقات بين الصومال والإمارات قتامة. أصابت الخلافات تعاون البلدين في المنطقة. Like other Horn of Africa countries, the Somali government adopted a neutral stance towards the Qatar dispute. The UAE, however, saw Mogadishu as silently in the pro-Qatar camp, and Abu Dhabi was not pleased. In 2017, as President Mohammed Abdullahi Purmajo assumed office, reports circulated that Qatar and Turkey had funded his campaign and further claims of official appointments to prominent positions within Farmajo's administration having ties to Doha and Ankara unnerved Abu Dhabi. The United Arab Emirates is ending a military training program in Somalia and closing a big hospital there. 
The Somali government alleges the UAE is now actively destabilizing the country, accusing it of funding opposition forces. These suspicions intensified after Dubai Ports World (DP World) bypassed the central government of Somalia and signed a deal with the semi-autonomous region of Somaliland to develop and operate Berbera Port. DP World even brought in Ethiopian investment and gave Addis Ababa a stake in the port. Mogadishu declared the deal illegal and tried to block it by taking out a complaint with the Arab League. Somaliland leader Musa Bihi Abdi said Farmajo's government was declaring war by attempting to block the deal. Under the deal, Somaliland stands to get an investment of up to $442 million and a separate agreement with Abu Dhabi to allow the UAE's military bases in the region could bring in a further $1 billion. Decades of civil war and the presence of extremist groups make Somalia a very fragile country. Fears the UAE's involvement could harm the country are a cause of constant concern for Mogadishu. Now to Sudan, where government sources say President Omar al-Bashir has resigned after 30 years in power. The UAE is a counter-revolutionary power in the Middle East. The UAE does not want to see any democratic projects succeed, not only in Sudan, but anywhere throughout the wider Arab region. This has to do with the UAE's concerns that demands for democratic change could build up not only throughout the Maghreb and the Levant, but that these uh, winds of change could blow into the Gulf and into the UAE itself. In 1989, Omar al-Bashir, a military commander, launched a coup and seized political power in Sudan. By 1993, he declared himself the president and his political party, the National Congress, became the dominant political force. The National Congress is Muslim Brotherhood aligned and as such was generally treated with suspicion by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. However, in the 2010s, al-Bashir's regime began distancing itself from the Brotherhood in order to improve relations with the GCC countries. We definitely saw uh, Bashir's regime and the UAE grow closer during Bashir's final years in power. This was all underscored by Sudan's decision to deploy forces to Yemen to strengthen the Saudi-led coalition. And then in 2016, we saw Sudan sever diplomatic relations with the Islamic Republic of Iran. All of this underscored how Bashir was moving Sudan into greater alignment with the GCC countries. Closer relations with Saudi Arabia and the UAE had a price. In 2015, Riyadh formed a coalition to intervene in Yemen. In 2011, the Yemeni government led by Ali Abdullahi Salah faced mass street protests known as the Arab Spring. Pressure would force him to step down in 2012. The power vacuum led to large parts of the country being taken over by the Iranian-backed Houthi group. The Saudi-led coalition aimed to crush the Houthis and declare war on them. Sudan became an important member of the war coalition. There are 10,000 of us in the Emirati Sudanese division, and there are other Sudanese units too. Whatever happens, we'll stay here to fight with the Arab coalition. The uh, Saudi-led coalition started having, having huge problems in their fight against the Houthi rebels, and there were uh, deaths of uh, Saudis in Emiratis and officials in Riyadh and Abu Dhabi wanted to minimize the number of their own civilians who were losing their lives in this war in Yemen. This is where these mercenary forces from Sudan became very useful and essentially just for money these Sudanese mercenaries would uh, engage in some of the ugliest fighting in Yemen. Uh, to put it simply, they were used as cannon fodder in the conflict. Now, many uh, Sudanese citizens objected to this, this issue of Sudanese mercenaries going to Yemen to fight for money was an issue 
that the revolutionaries focused on very heavily. The revolutionaries wanted to change Sudan internally, but also externally. Um, one of the ways they wanted to change Sudan's foreign policy was to end this practice of giving Sudanese mercenaries to Arab Gulf states for the fight in Yemen. In 2018, a popular uprising took place against Omar al-Bashir, and in April 2019, the military forced him from power. The military then formed a new government with civil opposition groups with the aim of transforming Sudan into a fully-fledged democracy, and the UAE moved to minimize the potential damage to its interests caused by the revolution. When the revolution was taking place in Sudan and anti-Bashir protests were gaining momentum, the UAE essentially threw Bashir under the bus. Uh, after Bashir was ousted, the UAE had an official narrative about what happened in that revolution. And this narrative was that the people of Sudan revolted against Bashir's government because of their opposition to the Muslim Brotherhood. UAE and Saudi Arabia pledged a huge amount of money to the Sudanese deep state. And by the Sudanese deep state, what I'm really talking about is the Sudanese military. The Sudanese military uh, being very close to the UAE uh, and Saudi Arabia was, according to Abu Dhabi, supposed to ensure that Sudan stays closely aligned with the UAE on regional issues and that Sudan remains a very UAE-friendly country. However, the fall of al-Bashir means the UAE's position in Sudan is not guaranteed and some fear that the Emirates could try to subvert Sudan's democratic transition. Because there are anti-UAE sentiments on the part of various elements within Sudan's civil society that is represented by the civilian component of the government, the country as a whole is not as aligned with the UAE as Abu Dhabi had wanted. There are times in which the militaristic deep state has to uh, maintain a certain equilibrium in the country, which requires compromising with the civilian-led component of the government. For example, the military leadership in Sudan did not deploy mercenary forces to Libya to support General Khalifa Haftar, despite the UAE asking the Sudanese deep state to do so. Ethiopia seems to have benefited hugely from the partnership with the UAE, as the East African country has emerged as a big investment opportunity. In February 2020, the UAE agreed to invest $100 million to support micro, medium and small scale projects across the country. Additionally, the UAE has pledged to build an oil pipeline between Ethiopia and Eritrea, which will provide the landlocked nation with much needed energy. Indeed, this energy deal is possible after the UAE engineered a peace treaty between Eritrea and Ethiopia in 2018. The peace agreement was held up as an example of the UAE's prowess. Ethiopia managed to gain these benefits while avoiding the polarizing effects of the Qatar blockade. What is notable is that uh, to the credit of the Ethiopian leadership, this landlocked African country has done an impressive job in terms of circumventing polarizing pressures on Addis. Uh, officials in Addis have refused to uh, take sides in conflicts taking place outside of Africa. So when the Qatar disputes uh, began, uh, Ethiopia was keen to maintain good relations with the countries blockading Qatar, as well as the Qatar-Turkey bloc. In November 2020, armed conflict broke out in Ethiopia's Tigray region between the government forces and a powerful regional rebel army. The rebel leader openly accused the United Arab Emirates of carrying out a drone strike in Tigray from its base in Eritrea at the behest of Addis Ababa. While evidence has yet to emerge of the strike, it does indicate there is some local anxiety about the role Abu Dhabi might be playing in this potentially explosive situation. 
Ethiopia has begun filling the reservoirs of a controversial mega dam on the Blue Nile. That's according to the country's water minister. Egypt and Sudan had requested the Grand Renaissance Dam not be filled until an agreement is reached. Ethiopia could cause issues for the UAE and Saudi Arabia. As another close ally of the Gulf states, Egypt has expressed anger at Addis Ababa's dam across the River Nile. The Grand Renaissance Dam, built by Ethiopia, reduces Nile water levels in Egypt, harming its energy, economic and environmental needs. Negotiations to find a solution keep breaking down and regional tensions are high. The dispute involving Ethiopia, Sudan and Egypt raises the stakes to an incredible degree. Although it's very fortunate that these tensions have not manifested in any military confrontation, there are some regional experts who warn that a war over the dam is a possibility that cannot be ruled out. If such a nightmarish scenario were to unfold, we would have to keep in mind that Saudi Arabia and the UAE are very close to Egypt. It seems to me a very safe bet that Egypt would receive uh, support from the GCC countries if there were to be a war between Ethiopia and Egypt over this dam. The Horn of Africa is a playground for rising UAE aspirations and is a microcosm of what the UAE aims to replicate across the African continent. Much of this is driven by the decline of US influence globally. New regional alliances and powerhouses are emerging to manage international security. However, the UAE does not exercise total control over East Africa and is still in its early stages of developing its reach and influence. The Horn is full of flashpoints and the UAE could either help stabilize or destabilize the region.